How uh, much detail do you want? Well, let's find out. Um, first off, I'm just, you know, um, Parksville. I mean, what do you, I mean, what can you, what can you tell me early on about, let's say, your dad is a barber in Parksville? Um, uh, Parksville. I wish I could say I remember a hell of a lot, mm -hmm. <laughs> but not really. The first thing that really struck me was when the center died, believe it or not. I was in the kitchen. I was being dressed. That was a warm room in the, in the house because we had a cold stove there. And I was being dressed on the chair. I guess I was wearing the long underwear. My mother was dressing me. And lo and behold, we have no phone. But we got a telegram delivered somehow. And it was the notice that Sender had died. And my mother just passed out on the floor. That was her brother? That was my father's brother. Father's brother, okay. He was the youngest. There was he and Hyman, which is Milton's father, and Sander was the youngest. And, uh, well, she was on the floor, and eventually somebody came and took care of things. I really don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. As a child, I can tell you that I was a, born a mess with rickets, a very severe malocclusion mm -hmm. to the point that my speech was not understandable. And for a while I was considered to be the village idiot. And uh, we were living in Parcel. My dad had the barber shop in a little building next door and it got to the point where there were no longer enough winter inhabitants to make a living. So at the age of about five, we moved to the Bronx, near Bronx Park. And I was sent to a speech therapy class in a neighboring school and learn how to speak. And I was intelligible, but not too good. Fortunately, a friend of my brother, Mo, who was a dentist, and he said malocclusion very severely and unless it's straightened out, the speech will never be intelligible. They gave me speech therapy in school. I went to an orthodontist in Manhattan for a few years, wore braces, hurt like the devil, and lo and behold, my speech wasn't great but it was intelligible. I went a lot rapidly through the school system in Florida, in, uh, in Parksville. Oh, in Parksville, okay. And uh, I must have gone there for a year or a half year. It was a two-room schoolhouse. One room was one to four. The other was five to eight. And those that were in session were moved up to the front seat and the rest remained in the back. And uh, it must have been a little later than five I went to uh, New York. Because then we had a new school room, also a tool room school system, but 
a little nicer class, a brick building, and we didn't get hit with a ruler every time we didn't behave. And uh, in a two-room schoolhouse, if you don't go to sleep, you learn more than the first grade and so on. And when we finally did go to New York City, it had to be after, probably be about six, age. I went to a local school and uh, they advanced me through the school system. I don't know why, but I guess from a so-called village idiot, I developed into a fairly good student. We lived in a old building bought from the Orsic brothers. We had uh, in partial, we had a pump outside, which we kept primed. We would get our water and we had a two-seat outhouse out there. And of course, we we had a uh, the, the sewage consisted of the tank outside in the dirt, and it was years later that we got what we called the improvements. We had running water. We had a stove in the kitchen a coal stove. It took care of the heat through the whole house, including the bedrooms upstairs. There was a chimney going through and that gave a little heat to the bedrooms. But we also used a hot water bottle, several in the beds mm -hmm. before we got in into the bed at night and we all used quilts because it was cold there. The heat of the house was provided by the coal. The cooking was done on the stove and the prime seat in the kitchen was a rocking chair near the stove where I learned to read. And I remember my mother, who was illiterate, was overjoyed that I, by the fact that I was reading. Anyhow, as I had related before, the population diminished to the point where it was not possible to make a living. We moved to the Bronx. And there I was, for some strange reason, I accelerated through, through the classes. We spent summers in Parksville. Dad worked the barbershop. He taught Celia to do a manicuring and some hair work. Etta got a job with Uncle Don in New York City. They both went to James Monroe High School and they were put in the same class. Uh, Edward keep an eye on Celia was a little more rambunctious. The fact is they both graduated together in 28 in a class with Hank Greenberg. I went to grade school in the Bronx. Herman Ritter 
junior high just opened. I attended that school. A classmate of mine was Henry, Henrietta Frecker, who was in my class. From there, we went to James Monroe, and they kept advancing me all the time, and I still don't know why. But apparently, I was doing well enough at that time. Went to James Monroe, and I graduated fairly early. I was 15 and a half, graduated in the winter. And at 15 and a half, I was prepared to face the world to get a job. And I decided to uh, spend a little time growing up. I went to City College at night. And then I went to barber school learned some barbering and did that in Parksville for a couple of years in the summertime. Sold newspapers in the morning, sold ice cream from the rumble seat of my Ford. It was not a Model T, it was a Model A Ford. And I'm skipping around a little bit. Graduated from James Monroe. We were living in the Bronx. I became a barber. Are you still going there? Uh, I am now. Hang on one second. Good. I went to City College at night and did a little barbering in New York City. A few in the in the daytime, because in some of the barber shops in New York City, in the clothing district around 29th Street. Eventually, I saved enough money to go to City College in the daytime. I would work Saturdays in a barber shop and do pretty well there. And of course, money was tight then. It was depression time. And uh, it was a hand to mouth existence. Oh, yeah, we're talking 1936, 1937, something along these lines. Yeah. yeah. No, I graduated from high school in. 35. 35. Right. 35, 36. The end of the year. 35, 36. Uh, where was I? I? I was then attending City College in the daytime, preparing my first two years, and I had decided that optometry would be my field, and I was taking the prerequisites for Columbia, where they had a school of a college of optometry. I, I had some trouble with them, and they were not giving out a doctorate because of the strength of their medical school, and therefore I switched at the end of, I put in between two, two or three years of credit in City College, I switched then to what was called the Pennsylvania State College of Optometry in Philadelphia. It was not part of Penn State. Uh, right now it's <laughs> appropriate. Anyhow, that was a private college. And uh, I took taught the course there. Surprisingly enough, I graduated with honors in the first five of the graduating class. And from there I went and took a job on New York City, Canal Street, 
and then uh, in Jersey City at a jewelry store temporarily until I could get enough money to buy some equipment and uh, either open my own place or buy an existing practice and it worked that way. I left New Jersey, worked with a chain for a few years, I managed the chain and I found a practice for sale in Connecticut. It was a rundown practice. The man was pretty much of a failure, but the equipment was there and it was cheap. And I had enough money to buy the practice and moved to and uh, started working in Connecticut in this practice that I bought which was pretty poor. I had to build it up. In the interim, I was living in Mount Vernon, got married there to my first and my most memorable wife, Pearl. So let's back up for a second. Uh, how did you meet her? Pardon? How did you meet Pearl? Oh, I missed that. I grew up in the Catskill Mountains in Southern County. One year I went on a vacation to the Adirondacks to make things different. And I was sitting and watching, watching a tennis game. I used to play a little tennis in Parksville with Rosie Gross at the Black Apple Inn in La Chaudre. Well, I met, I met Pearl watching the tennis matches there and it clicked at once and uh, we saw each other regularly there and when we vacation finished, I traveled from Mount Vernon to Brooklyn to continue my association with Pearl. While we were on vacation, I gave her a haircut and she told her mother that I cut her hair. And her mother said, what, you meant a barber? And uh, so she explained that it was a sideline at that point. My barbering days were through now. I was now, now an optometrist with a doctorate in optometry and the practice in we were living in, we were living in Mount Vernon. I was traveling up to Norwalk and the practice was right near the railroad station, fortunately. And sure slowly and gradually I was able to build up the practice. It was on uh, 42 North Main Street, opposite the city hall, upstairs in a, in a small office building. Hang and on. from there... Hang on one second. Right. Okay. okay. Actually, I want to back up, I'm going to back up a little bit. Tell me a little bit about uh, Mo as a kid. Mo. Tell me when you're ready. Oh, it's, it's running. Mo, Mo was my big brother. He looked after me. And uh, Mo went directly to City College from James. No, he graduated from Liberty High. Liberty High, he went directly to City College. spent his time there. He went to days and he graduated normally and at that time 
Uh, he, got the, he got the first degree in the family, right? The first degree in the family. How about as a, how about as a kid? Um, what, was, what was he like as a kid? Well, he was my big brother. He had his own, he had his own bunch. He was hanging out, and I was ha hanging out with the kids. Mm -hmm. But he had, he had his ice cream thing in the summer. Wait a minute! I'm, I've skipped the war. Okay, we can we can we can back up because um, well, let's see. Because how did you uh, how did you end up getting involved with World War Two? Well, I said at the end of my at the end of year one at the School of Optometry, the war had broken out. We were on the list for the services. And my school decided then, rather than have the the four-year term for the, for the doctorate in the normal seasons, they were going to go right through the summer and continue straight on through. Well, I meant getting up enough money for tuition. I was. I was at private school now, and the money was uh, a little tight then. So I I left I left the college then. I left the optometry school, worked in the barber shop, and then found out that there was a place. If I enlisted in the army, I could get into the signal core and work on radar, which they needed badly. And uh, that was pretty much my area. I was doing fairly well in math and so on. And I, I enlisted in the Army in, what was it? Oh yeah, someplace along the along the Hudson River. Uh, it was a big city then. It's not put, not Port Jervis, but the other one on the Hudson River. Anyhow. Poughkeepsie? Near there. Near them. Near, near Poughkeepsie, but further out to the river. I might, well, not important. Okay. I enlisted there, and they sent me to school in Troy, New York, and uh, the staff was mainly from RPI, and I spent a few months there, in a few months in New York City, six months in all, and I was a radar specialist. And I, I think I was tied for first in that class, believe it or not, because uh, I knew a little more, a little more schooling than, than most people who were looking for an easy mark. And from there I went to, well, I went into the service and... Uh, where was boot camp? Where did they take all the soldiers from, uh, from New York City? Boot camp was uh, New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Boot camp was in New Jersey. We did our basic training there. I met Nat there. You didn't know Nat, did you? I don't think so. Nat was Sylvia Parker's husband. Hmm. Uh, but I did my basic training there and the 25 mile hike and so on, and uh, lasted, believe it or not. We stopped for five minutes on the hour. I stopped for at least four. Oh, we made it. Mm -hmm. It was stupid of me to do it. I could have counted out that minute, but I didn't. 
And how did they get you over to Europe? Well, uh, from there, they sent me to Fort Monmouth. I was to complete my basic training as a signal corps uh, camp. And when I got there, we were lined up. The next 10 people stand in that corner. All right. You are now, you're no longer a, uh, <laughs> you're no longer de dealing with your specialty. You're going to be in the infantry and with field wire. And you're not going to do the, uh, what that was that was radar. radar. No more radar for you. The English has enough radar. And now you're going to be a field wire man. And uh, they didn't say we were going to do the invasion, but I knew it. And we were doing a basic training in field wire. And sure enough, uh, we had to go to Washington, D.C. for to put on a show, an expedition, uh, just for public display. And they needed somebody from from my from my uh, company. And since I was doing well scholastically, I got picked. So I went down, and sure enough, they needed somebody who uh, knew facsimile. Facsimile was the early predecessor to fax. We did it through wires. And I learned facsimile down there. I had a week of it or so at Fort Monmouth, and I went down there as a specialist. And I and I became a facsimile specialist. And then suddenly we went to a a camp near Pennsylvania. We call a reembark an embarkment camp, and from there we went to uh, to New York, and the ship the ships were ready to take off. The Red Red Cross was there, giving us notice, and the MPs were there with their guns to make sure nobody escaped. And we got on that old English tub. Uh, Oh, it was a real time. Uh, I'll think of the name as we, we go along. Anyhow, it was an old passenger ship, not enough to go a, a convoy. It was a little fast for the convoy, so we went along, but we were we were a sitting duck. And uh, it took us about 10 days to get across. Luckily enough, I got to the bottom of the ship at the very end. And by the end of the by the end of the day, I was seasick enough to get into the hospital ship. And any time I saw somebody coming nearby, I shut my eyes and went to sleep. I went most of the way across in the hospital ship. Didn't do much eating, but it was better than better than throwing up all the time, and I was pretty bad. We finally got we finally got with all the zigzagging, and we saw the we saw the queen pass us by, like we were standing still. That's when we knew how slow we were. We finally got to. Uh, Scotland, the Firth of Forth in Scotland. I remember that. And uh, we got on a British railroad train and slowly we worked our way down the coast to uh, 
a small English city with a thatched roofs, whose name again I will remember in Virginia. And on the way down, the train stopped because we were, had nothing to eat. And but the English knew we were going to stop there, and they gave us. I thought they were grass sandwiches. It tasted like grass, and. Uh, that got us finally to uh, our small stopping place where they decided where they were going to send us. And finally, they sent me to a small, small, and I mean small, small town called Bear Austin. Where so you stopped in this small, small town. Bear Austin. And we were in a uh, Nissan hut. And fortunately, uh, I, got, I got a bunk not too far from the stove. We had a stove like this, and uh, that was our heat. And we couldn't make it through the night because it was too cold. And we all had a latrine break in another Nissan hut. We had to go out and get to the Nissan hut. And during the day, we didn't do much but a lot of exercise. We did PT with logs. Uh, you take these logs, throw them and march. Uh, and really didn't do much. The best part of it was after the evening chow time, the town was so small that they had narrow streets where they couldn't get two, two vehicles through there at the same time. There's wide enough for one vehicle. The postman had a bike. But the best thing is we had a... Uh, I had a little bar. I forget the name, I would remember it. And we used to go there after dinner, and we would really, we would do our eating there and our drinking. So we would get our, we get our fish, fish and chips, and the beer. And that took, took us into the evening, and then we finally went to sleep. We had enough to eat and enough to drink, but we couldn't make it through the night. It was cold. It was, there were a few of the, uh, very few of the British gals around. They were the land army. They were lost in the ugliest of the bunch who didn't bother much with them. And from there, That was, that was where the 29th Division had their uh, field wire, field wire and, and uh, the rest of it. The, the, whole, the whole 29th Division Signal Company was there. We stayed there for a while and then we finally went to uh, Tavistock. Tavistock, we had pretty much the entire single company. And Tavistock was a nice area, not too far from Plymouth. Uh, there was a few bucks around there. It was a horse country. And uh, living was a little easier. We had, we had bunks. And uh, we didn't do all our training in the holes in the ground. We had a, a real... I got busy there. I did some work. I did some work with the uh, facsimile machine, but mainly they got me into the... Uh, into the switchboard room 
and before long I became a supervisor in the switch room because I had some facility in French from my high school days and I studied German in college. So I was able to uh, get some communications which we didn't need much of then but they knew I would use later on. And they had the best thing there is we would get through a dinner and run into town and if we got there early we might get time for scotch before they ran out. The beer was it wasn't warm, like they say. It was kept in the cellar. It was, it was not bad. And uh, we, we, we drank and we ate, but we mainly drank until it was time to get shipped out. Then we did a, uh, we did a mock invasion of the one of the beaches in England. That was a catastrophe. Uh, we lost a lot of our ships. The Germans must have got wind of it. And they, uh, I don't know how many of our ships they got. And uh, it was pretty bad. And I realized they were very serious because when we finally invaded the beach, I saw Eisenhower there, so I knew uh, there were good times ahead. And sure enough, from there, we were finally sent to a, an embarkment camp where we were supposed to be in incommunicado with all the gals that we had met there. And some were pretty busy, including the general's aide. General Zaid wanted to call his girlfriend back in the, not in the embarkment area, and I wouldn't put her through. He got mad in hell, and uh, I know it was a little, I guess he was the first lieutenant or something or other. He complained bitterly, and he got to my signal officer, who was a colonel, colonel who stood up for me. And he did, I didn't want to, I didn't want the information to get out that we had D-Day planned. Mm -hmm. And I took it seriously. And boy, he hated me. Until we got to, until we got to uh, France. Okay, from the embarkment camp, we went directly to our ships taking us over the English Channel. I was put on a LST, which is a terrible ship for the English Channel, especially with the English cooking. And we were scared to death from the invasion. And uh, we knew that we were going to make the invasion on Omaha Beach, D-Day. That was us. We got our destination, uh, whose name I would remember if I had the book in front of me. Sword or uh, one of those? Omaha things. Beach. Yeah. Omaha was the worst. They were ready for us. There was a storm there and the uh, doing it on the LST was no fun. Well, you're thinking of Operation Overlord in general. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. And we were crossing the channel to get to Omaha Beach. I was all the Lord. We got the worst beach of all, but the rages were to our right, and they were worse. They had a higher cliff, and they had to go up the embankment, and the Germans were up there cutting their, cutting their rope and shooting down on them. And we saw that the English were on the left of us. And uh, when we got there, we couldn't get off right away because we didn't have any place to go. We had to let the engineers go and try to cut through the minefield because they had no water. 
and it had all these obstacles in the water, and they were mined underwater, and our engineers were supposed to go cut them and make them ready. They weren't too successful. Many of them exploded as we were trying to make the beach. Up in the air we had these wires and balloons so the Germans could send their airplanes to uh, shoot us and bomb us. So we had these big cables going up in the air. And at night we had from, from way up at night, they would send their, their loud bombers, the crummy ships, they had a siren attached to them. They uh, didn't like to hear them. Anyhow, we couldn't, we couldn't land right away while the fighting was going on during the day. The guys were getting massacred. They were getting off their ships and being how they were going. Uh, I didn't get on the beach until late at night. I got as far as up to the cliff and there we stayed. And I was trying to dig a, dig a foxhole with a toy shovel and the uh, the major was standing next to me. He was a major or something rather. He looked at me and said, I might borrow that. I said, you'll borrow what? <laughs> and uh, that was the end of it. I had it to myself. But I was pretty skinny then. And uh, I dug down about this far. What were you doing while all of this was going on during the day? Waiting on the boat. We couldn't, we couldn't get off the boat. We, there was no room on us on the beach. As soon as we got our, our guns and our half tracks there, with their 88s, they were ready for them. They were in the cliffs, and they, get, they kept knocking them out, one right after the next. We couldn't get anybody on the beach. We had these big guns from the battleships, but they were shooting way the hell over the beach, trying to keep the reinforcements from coming. Finally, the signal corps contacted the destroyers. They had five-inch guns, and they would shoot them into the cliffs and get rid of the, some of the Germans there who had their machine guns and their 88s well intoned there. And by the time we got rid of them, then we could get some dynamite. There's some question about how we got up to the top. But we blew a hole in the, in the wall that they had put up. And we got up above the cliff. And that's where we finally spent the night. And from there we moved on. Were they able to bring uh, any wounded back to the ships while you were there? Yes. Away? Yes. And they brought some onto the ships while, before we got off. Mm -hmm. We got off the LST down the ropes. And we were wearing the uh, chemical clothing, underwear, socks, everything. We went down on the ropes. So, uh, let me see, we were talking about the... Uh, we, were getting off, we were getting off the uh, LST, but we couldn't get in too, too close, actually. But close enough so that when we let ourselves down the, down the ropes, into the water. The water came up to about here. And I was tall enough so that uh, I held my gun up and we had a full pack, including the uh, gas mask and so on. So we were loaded. We were loaded with stuff. Fortunately, we got it to the water. It wasn't over our heads although some of our tanks that were supposed to swim in the water, I assure them would go right under. They went to the bottom. Everybody, everybody was going in there. I guess they put too much stuff in and uh, too much weight. Poor bastards. Anyhow, we walked ashore and there was this 
one narrow path off to the left where we were able to get up up the cliff. They had managed that. Carter, General Carter was the, in charge of that. He was a nice guy. Not not our not our not Charlie Guerra, who was our general. He didn't he didn't come that day. Carter came. And we came up to the top, spent the night there. And then the next day we we kept working our way in because we were working our way in but very slowly. We didn't go very far. And we didn't get to the uh, to our first day's destination. It took us four or five days to get there. And uh, Revereville, Revereville Shormir, that was the name of it. It was a tiny little town, that was that selection. Five, and so on, and uh, from then it was just moving along on the ground. What we were doing then is setting up communications for the general staff. And for a while I was fi fixing up what we call the war room. The general liked to have all sorts of e equipment in her, his room. And that wasn't bad. And uh, one time his phone wasn't working and uh, nobody wanted to volunteer. So they picked out a Jew naturally. And uh, I get down there. It was easy to fix. Nothing much to it. The general's aide was there. He looked daggers at me at first, but then uh, it was all right. I saw him putting shoulder pads on his under his shirt when he was dressing it, so he looked husky. Anyhow, any time the general had trouble with his phone, he would call me. And that was that. But we generally made our way. Uh, and when we, when we were made a forward move, we would go and set up a switchboard again. And we had to set up communications for all the colonels. They all had to have their lines coming into the switchboard. And we had uh, the group running lines down from the general's headquarters to the regiment. The regiment had uh, theirs to, uh, God. They were worse. They were worse off than we were. We were, we were running from the, from the general's area, which was not too bad. But a few of them, the guys were sent out to set up a uh, switchboard and communications, and we didn't have the area yet. So those guys were killed or captured. Some were captured. One was a Jewish fellow. I never thought I'd see him again, but I did. But he was a sergeant. And uh, the Germans treated the uh, sergeants and so on a little better. I was at that time, that time I was a corporal. I was a sergeant when I got to Germany. When did you become a sergeant? I, I became a T4. Uh, three stripes and a T, mm -hmm. and then I became a, uh, a regular sergeant. In my uh, my field wire lieutenant didn't like me much. I didn't like him either. He cut my email to ribbons, son of a bitch. But I got even with him. He wanted to leave early, get discharged early. And the uh, the signal officer was a friend of mine because I helped him out and when the war was over. He offered me his liquor. He didn't drink. And he said, I'll make you a, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll make you an officer right here. I'll make you an officer in the field. And I said, would I have to remain in the army? He said, yes. And I said, no. <laughs> and that was the end of it. He still gave me his liquor because another outfit and somebody who was a technical sergeant wanted to take over the, the switchboard. 
and uh, we were communicating with the Germans through that switchboard. And he said, the guy has more, more stripes than you do, but you do me a favor. You won't have to stay in any formations. I'll give you my liquor. He took good care of me. So I, I had it nice. And I picked out to see Yasha Heifetz. And I saw uh, that German, Marlene Dietrich. Mm -hmm. So those were my little rewards for supervising the communications. Uh, what kind of uh, direct firefights did you end up in? St. Law was the worst. And maybe, maybe St. Law was the worst. They almost got killed there. I told you they were, we were, we were bombing them. We couldn't get through them. They, they had a locked height. They knew if we got there, we'd go all the way up to the, to the river. So all what, the happened, rules. what happened at St. Lowe? St. Lowe, they put their best troops up there, including Max Shelley and their regular troops. We couldn't budge them. We couldn't budge them. That was a strong point. They knew if we got there, we would roll. We had all the roads going across Germany. So they were stubborn. So we sent our, our bombers, our big bombers, up there to bomb them. And we did. But the only problem was we put up a smoke screen for target and the wind was blowing towards us. And uh, until we got in touch with them to stop, uh, we lost one of our generals there. And uh, in my, my foxhole was bouncing <laughs> and the slugs were falling down. It wasn't funny. Anyhow, we got out of there and, and they started across and we, we were with uh, General Patton at that juncture. We were glad to get rid of him. We went over to free the uh, submarine, the submarine thing up on uh, Brittany, was it? I forget where the hell it was. Anyhow, they, we couldn't bomb them. They were way, way underneath. We couldn't bomb them. We had to go in and take it. And that was a, that was a tough one. And they defended it fiercely. And uh, they, were, they were shelling us incessantly. And I would, I would never go out to, to lunch because they, 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 they would shoot all their guns at us while we were at chow time. So I was living on salamis that they were sending from here. And they came all moldy and I put them over the fire and burned off some of them old made it. I wasn't a fast eater. The fast eaters, I envied them, yeah. So anyhow, that was, that was terrible. That was as bad as... How long did that go on? That went on for a couple months. Yeah. We had a hard, they were defending that fiercely because that's where, that's where their submarines, that was their main submarine place and the submarines were intercepting our ships. It was well defended and we had a hell of a time getting in there. And we had to get in there and it was well defended. They really defended that well. And uh, we got shelled a lot there. That was bad. And they were doing it in the pattern. And we could tell when the pattern Parent was coming to us. And along the way, they were shelling us in the fields with their 88s. And uh, fortunately, I picked the spot, but uh, there was an Irish kid from the Bronx. We had a two man foxhole. He said, No, that's on a corner. They're going to hit that spot, surely. Let's get out in the middle. And we, we took. 
his advice, and they hit my spot head on. Wow. He was going to come to visit me, but he died and his wife died. Wife is Mary. Oh boy. Anyhow, after that, we went through the truck through Paris. We stopped there for a minute. And uh, I probably told you that the truck load was for heating up our ranches. And the little man with the beret came over and spoke to me in Yiddish. And I was the only one who. Okay. Then we went up through Belgium, slept in a school on a wooden floor. That was a treat. That was a treat. Went up to Holland, couldn't dig any foxholes because the water level was too high, surrounded. And we stayed in Holland for quite a while before we went into Germany. We went into Germany, that was bad. Germany was bad, it was getting into the winter. And we were going way the hell up north. What the, the name of the place? Oh, shit. Uh, it was like St. Louis down south. It was a strong point up north. Nobody had ever broken through that before. None of the wars. We had to get through there. Because St. Louis we had the southern route. Not the southern route, but the southern flank of ours. And up here on the north, it was on the river. And not the Elbe River, the other river. It was on the river there. We had a hell of a time there. We were living in the ground. It was cold. And uh, the, uh, the Israeli sent us a general. When he went out at night, had to go to the bathroom. He didn't know the password. He got shot and he killed. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of that? If I looked at my book, I'd know it. It doesn't matter. It was the northern flank of the uh, of the German line, of the Siegfried line. And they put up a hell of a fight there. We took a lot of casualties. And we were freezing. It was cold. It was way up north. And just, just below us. No, it wasn't then. It was later on. We finally, after months, we finally got through there. This was the next one. The next time we got stopped. That's when the, the Germans did their breakthrough. We were at the northern flank of that. One over was us, but they wouldn't. Uh, they wouldn't, wouldn't come at us because we had experienced fighters. That time, they came at the middle part. We were that cooks and bakers, and uh, they didn't arm. They went through them like cheesecake. The guys that were sent to uh, ASTP which they were going to send me to, to become physicians. Those guys were pulled out. Anybody to uh, put up something to slow them down. Eventually the weather turned. We slowed them down and we took it back. That was the end. But Patton came up from Italy. He did a good job on that. That was the best thing he did. And shortly after that, Patton was dead. And the word was that our troops got him. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But Patton saved those Hohenzollern horses from... And once, the, uh, once we went over the Elbe, we met the Russians. Uh, we settled down in a 
Tan Munchen Gladbach. That was the home of Ge Goebbels has castle there. And we had your services and uh, it was broadcast back to the States. In his castle. In his castle. Yeah. A nice Shabbat dinner in Goebbels' house? <clears throat> no. No? No. No, we went back to our usual crap. But the the fellow who holds the Torah came from Texas and he came east one year. He looked me up in uh, Florida. And uh, he had it printed in his uh, newspaper back in Texas. I have a copy of it here someplace in the, my uh, file kit. All right, why don't we... Uh, all right. I believe... Yeah, it looks like I'm actually rolling right now. Um, now. I'm pretty sure we had left off with... Oh. I'm going to hope that this is running okay. Um, I am pretty sure we left off. I'm going to adjust this just. Actually, let me do that. I think we left off where you were talking about you were being shelled and a friend of yours, you know, a, a buddy of yours that decided you needed to move your foxhole. And it was a damn good thing you did. Oh yeah, that was Pat Burns. He lived in the Bronx. And uh, he was a laborer with railroad. And uh, you know, he, he didn't get along with it. And when we were discharged, we stopped off at his house first. His idea was a very entertainment. He's going to the pub downstairs and drinking beer. Mm -hmm. He was about to visit me in my in the Norwalk. His wife died before he did, and he died. I remember they lived on a hill. In the Bronx. Was this in France where that was going on? No. That was already in Germany? That was after we were discharged. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about after you were being shelled. That was oh, in oh, France that or Germany. Was, that was in Germany. That was in Germany, okay. In Germany. So. It may still have been in France because. We had those, the quadrangle, I forget what they call those, those big bounds separating the different properties mm. in our tanks had trouble. The hedgerows? Hedgerows. Yeah, okay. And our tanks had problems with those. They'd have to go up and down until a farm boy a farm boy from out in the Midwest realized that you put those goddamn cutters in the in the front of the tank and it just loved them all right up. And you didn't lift yourself up and get your get caught on the hill, yeah. Yeah. And if you got hit there, you're vulnerable. Didn't have too much armor there. And uh, no, we 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 dug foxholes together. Uh, started in France, right right on through the war. Took and some time, I would imagine, to walk all the way into Germany. Well, we we would ride on a truck. Mm -hmm. It was a. Uh, Parallel seats to the size five on the side. Ten in the truck. We had ten in our team. Uh, we 
we had a little trailer. The trailer consisted of my equipment, the telephoto, the telephoto equipment, which we dragged all through there. Uh, it was a pain to drag it, but it was a big piece of equipment. Included was a uh, equipment for dark room, mm -hmm. and when the war ended, that was in Bremen, I guess. I built I built the dark room for myself. I was able to uh, pick up some e extra equipment along the way, and we did a little looting. I come to a photographer shop. Make sure it wasn't connected with a bomb someplace, because they would leave those behind. Mm. I was very, very careful with that. And I used to do. Okay. And without a good fixer, the pictures faded after a while. Yeah. And uh, anyhow, I had some fun with it because after. The, the war was over. We, we were stationed in Bremen for a few months. And uh, being able to speak German, I was in charge of a, uh, a recreation pretty big, uh, pretty big room. Mm -hmm. And uh, bought some wine along the Rhine River and did the hiring. The hiring was fun because if they were too well dressed or too good looking, I figured they were Nazis. They couldn't get too well taken care of, huh? Couldn't get a job. No, they couldn't pass me. And uh, and the last month we were there we used to stay in the barracks and we'd play uh, a game of cards, I forget the name of it. And I was giving lectures on venereal disease. None of us wanted to pick up the cops because the old expression was milk it. And you had to have a clear penis. Nobody wanted to get stuck behind there. No kidding. And when we left at night to go down to our pub, as we called it, you had to go through the company clerk's office and, and you had to pick up rubbers. That was a necessity, yeah. Mm -hmm. and now, uh, I mean, were you often in a position where you were firing your weapon? Uh, not at that time. The war was over. No, I don't mean that. I mean... Oh, yes. Yeah. When we first came to France, they left a lot of snipers behind. And we were digging foxholes. We were looking for old barns. We'd pick up doors so we'd have a roof over it. And we'd just leave an open area and come in underneath. Mm -hmm. And over the doors, whatever piece of lumber would punch in dirt in a tarp if if we could find one. And they left a bunch of snipers and we were carousing around looking for new fields. We wouldn't enter them alone mm -mm. because the snipers were up in the trees there and they wouldn't want to give their position away if we were not alone. So we did do those things alone. We always had a few people do it simultaneously. And uh, some of the people look at They were generally up, up in a tree somewhere. Sure, take the high ground. Yeah. And, uh, but they, they still got, they still picked us off. You see a good likely spot. And they were, you had said they would uh, cut your communication line and just wait for you to come and repair it. Well, we were always putting down lines 
from division to the regiment and they would they would sever a line and then wait there until we come to spice it up, repair it. We were supposed to use tape over it and tie a knot. Many of the time we just we had two kinds of tape, a rubber tape and a regular one. Well, we were in a hurry, and we generally were, we generally just tied it up and, and one little bit of tape. And we would never go up a tree or a pole. We had climbers to go into a pole and work our way up a pole. We would do that. Of course, we'd be targets. We would lay it on the ground, or else try to make a little furrow in dirt roads to cover it up. And the other bad thing was setting up a new uh, a PC. They called it a new headquarters. They would send us out ahead to a certain position, and we would be the first ones there. We would dig a big hole for the switchboard, switchboards, mm -hmm. and then set up communications inside some buildings, which were going to be occupied by the general and the various Colonels, and uh, they were numbered one, two, or three. They had intelligence, and so on. And uh, many of the time, we would go to an area which we thought we controlled, and we didn't. And uh, we took some casualties there. We also had some prisoners taken there. And one of my friends was a, uh, a sergeant from the Bronx. No, from Mount Vernon. From Mount Vernon. He was Jewish. I never thought I'd see him again. And we had a reunion when the war was over. And I was surprised to see him. I, I thought you were dead. <laughs> The hell of a thing to say. He probably thought so too. Yeah. But it turned out he was a non com. In the German army, the non coms were treated better than the privates and so on. So it wasn't a terrible experience, and he came back alive. So that was good. The. Uh, The other times that we were, we had to cross some bodies of water. And they, they had that keyed in pretty well. And they like, they, they like to uh, wait until lunchtime. We would go out in a little lodge area to have our lunch. But then everybody get out there. Okay. And uh, one of the bad experiences, we found the cellar. And we were very good there. We had a little stove there. And by that time, I, I was getting salamis sent to me, so I didn't have to go to the big mess hall. And sure enough, they set up a bunch of mortars just outside our cellar. And the mortars are pretty loud and they don't go very far. And they queued in on those who were getting caught up with fire on that. And I was glad when they got out of there. After we 
after we got through St. Lowe, which was the time that our bombers were full by the smoke. Oh yes, it blew over you. It yeah. blew over us. We lost a general there. And um, I think it was our signal company that finally contacted the B-24s and B-17s and let them know that <laughs> the target of smoke was drifting our way and they had had the counters for that. They were bombing us. And uh, with the terrible name Friendly Fire, which is not very friendly. It wasn't friendly, no. no. You were shaking at the same time you were cursing. It was quite a combination. But after St. Low, which we leveled, and I mentioned that previously, that was their strong point. Once we got through there, there were a, a large number of roads leading across France. And we needed those to get our mechanized stuff through and penetrate. And when we, we broke through St. Lowe, again, they, they bombed at practical level. And the infantry couldn't go through there. They had their they had their best troops there, including Max Schmeling. So we had a bomb at uh, practically level. Patton went right across France, and that's the time we were sent up to Brest to get the submarines. But they were so far underneath that none of our None of our armaments could get through, not even the delayed fuses. And we had to actually take it by hand, which was costly. And uh, that was, I think, when we got through with that, our division was pretty well beat up. We had taken a lot of casualties, and they had new stuff. Uh, we were not the first ones in some of the other areas. We we came behind. Besides, just we didn't have the manpower anymore. And uh, we were slogging along. It, it, we were moving pretty well. We were moving pretty well. We went all the way up from the breast. We went all the way up. We stopped in Paris. And that's where I met my Parisian friend who spoke to me in Yiddish. Then we went to Belgium, slept, slept at the schoolhouse. I mentioned that. We couldn't. We went into Holland. Holland, we couldn't dig. Could take a foxhole because of the water level. We stayed in Holland and sort of built, uh, strengthened our outfit. Are you still coming through all right? And uh, we stayed in Belgium, a town called Her. Okay. And Herley was pretty much on the border of Germany. And uh, once we got strengthened again, we went through into Germany. And it was getting to be the German winter. It was pretty far north. We went way north, all the way through from this point on, the British were to our left. We were heading east, uh, and the British were just alongside of us. But we were used to fighting with them right from the time we were in England. So that was working well, but we had to face the, the German winter. It was pretty far up north. It was cold. It got dark early. And uh, 
as soon as it got dark, we were in our foxholes. And a very important at that time was the latrines. Because you try to get rid of everything before you got in the foxhole. And you, you made it your business to talk to somebody else and mention the code name for the night because if you had to go to get get out of there during the night and go to the bathroom, it didn't you didn't know the word for that night. And they changed it every day. You're in trouble. And we lost uh, an Israeli general at that time. I probably yeah, think I mentioned, mentioned that. that. Yeah. yeah, that was a shame. He was. Yeah, he was older, and he couldn't hold it like we did when we were young, you know. And he, I imagine he, uh, he maybe mistook the fact that he, he was invulnerable because he was a general, but he didn't remember the password. Mm -hmm. And so we lost him. We reached the the point up north, which was the equivalent of St. Louis down south. That was the northern end. If you broke through there, you'd have all the roads going through Germany. We had a hell of a time there. We didn't bond them. We, did, yeah. we just built a manpower and artillery. And eventually we worked through, it was pretty damn cold. I used to sleep in my overcoat. <laughs> I remember that. And we used the German coal mines when we were near the shower. Otherwise it was a helmet full of water and that was it. We broke through there, I can't, Remember the name of that? I think that's where we left off. It was the new arrivals that went up to beat the Russians at the Elbe River. Patton wanted to go through. He wanted to jo join up with the Germans and take on the Russians. But the, the better heads interfered with that. Anyhow, from there on, we uh, we weren't the first invasion. We were in reserve from that part in. It was a matter of crappy living, but we found an old outhouse, which we brought over. We found an old laundry machine which you brought over, and we had enough people, enough guys who not a, knew how to make it work. But we had an empty little train, and we used the expression "honey dipper," and we. By Vietnam, they started calling that shit burners. Yeah, they really did. So anyhow, we we had to pick up the, the short straws. And the long ones, I wasn't chosen, thank God. And we finally came up to the Elbe River, which we had. But we couldn't go across. We'd go halfway. That's all. And the Russians would beat us, and they would go halfway. Never all the way across. The Russians were very leery. But they took had taken a hell of a beating. Huge. And they lost far more than we did. And uh, if it weren't for them, I don't know that we could have done what we did. Well, yeah, forced them to fight on two fronts. Because they had them. And the weather was against them, too. And I remember the time the Russians captured Capture a big army of theirs, and Hitler was beside himself. 
but then they were starting to work back. And this was the point when they uh, they worked back part of the way, and that's when they came up with the bulge. And here we were right here, and the bulge was just to the south of us. We were we were pretty much emaciated at that time, and. But we experienced troops, and uh, they went for the soft underbelly, which was the ASTP students, cooks and bakers, and so on. They take it, they emptied out the schools, they threw all the manpower in there, and uh, they took the division, the 28th division, which was Norman Coda. He was. Our assistant general, he was our D-Day man. He helped us get through. He's a good man. And they took a shellacking. They didn't have any real troops in. But fortunately, the weather finally changed. And we were able to get our planes in and so on. And uh, from there we went on to uh, Bremen. I think by that time the Germans had pretty much given up. We went on to Bremen. We were stationed on, a, on an old German officer's training uh, club and uh, I was given a job of taking care of the wiring in the various buildings. They set up the, our staff offices there and we used a lot of the German civilians and, and they picked on me again because I was able to speak German. And I didn't go easy on them. I was pretty tough on them. And uh, we, re we remained in Bremen, and that's the time I, I ran into I ran into Red Holtzman. Red Holtzman was a basketball player from City College. We took a German course together, and uh, our general wanted to have the best basketball team in the European theater, and he did. We won the title. He reminds you of the, uh, the guy who wanted to do football in the uh, mesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, I ran into him. Uh, that was nice. He remembered me from the German class. And he found a place where we could get a bolt and dunk. <laughs> and that was nice. And we went into Bremen. And Bremen was pretty easy because the war was over then. And uh, it was a matter of time. And then when they finally, we were at Bremen when they, they let the, <laughs> the two cities of Japan go, the atom bombs, and there was not one dissent that I heard because of the fact that many of us, especially people like me, unmarried no children were destined to go to Japan. And uh, even though I, I saw a lot of the time there, they picked out the married ones, the ones with children, the ones with dependents, and, and I was remaining. But then I knew we weren't going to Japan. It was a matter of coming on home and they sent us up to Bremerhaven, which is about as far north as you can get. That was cold. And we were waiting for our ship to come in. It was another ship, very much like the, Ac the Aquitania that we took over. And we saw the new troops coming in. And they were on a, 
uh, a large ship as well. And they looked at us and we looked at them. And now they, they were all on one side of the boat. The boat wasn't riding level, it was tipping over. I, I never saw that before. They were all on one side. Got out to the... <laughs> and we yelled at them, you know, but we got out to the boat. It was, I think, New Year's Day, but just about then. It was again around the 1st of January. We came over. Okay. And he stayed there for the duration. He got home ahead of me because he, he was in before me. He met with his friend Eugene again. And uh, he met his future wife there. And then they went up to Liberty. They went up to Parksville. He started to work on the bungalow colony up on Hunter Lake. And he put he put that together. In addition to which he did insurance and real estate. I told you he was good at money and mathematics. And he said he stayed up there. Then he built the house, built the house of liberty. You remember that house? A brick house with a single row. Yeah. Funny, I, I visited that house not too long ago. It's still there, but the area is lousy. Liberty is now a crappy town. There is not a decent store located there. Liberty used to be one of the shining places. So he stayed there and eventually he went to work as an engineer for the uh, for the water. The water was drawn from those uh, the water was drawn from uh, west to Prosville, Calico, not that way. That's some big dams out there. And they supplied the water. And he was in charge of verifying that the construction was well. He knew, he knew a bit about construction. And he would, he was very tough on the concrete mix. It had to be exactly so. And uh, he'd make him do it over again because the water depended on it. It was critical. And they tried to convince him, no way. He was made of iron there. And finally, finally after the thing was done, they wanted to get rid of him. <laughs> so they gave him a job in New York. He was driving from Liberty to New York. He did that for a while until he finally retired. And uh, when he did, he was selling off the bungalows piece by piece. And. Uh, That's just when the, he developed a colon cancer. I remember we were, we were with Florence up to see I forget, I forget whose baby it was. Maybe it was Stuart's. I don't know. Somebody had a baby up in the up in the, Bo the Boston area and uh, Florence was up there with us for the, for the bridge or whatever it was 
she had to go back to the brie at that time. And uh, I guess I, uh, at that time, I got back from the war and I got the GI Bill and I went to the school one right after the next. I needed some cash. I stuck out the ball of pole. I did some barbering, but, but the main thing. And then I took a job at Rudolph Jewelers. That's when the end of school, you know what a new graduate is like there. They, they need a little practicality. Mm -hmm. I would. Yeah. And you had uh, you'd, uh, talked about uh, getting that, and then you talked about buying the practice on uh, 42 North Main Street. Yes. Um, how did you find the house on Douglas Drive? We saw an ad. I was getting the local paper. And my neighbor there was an accountant. I was very friendly with a nice guy. And he had just bought this land and he had a big ad in the paper. Within within one day we were up there because it went like crazy. Well, by the time we got up there, half of it was gone. We bought the the lot we bought was the most expensive lot he had. It required three thousand dollars extra. But we were fortunate that he needed four trees for his water tower, and we were the only ones who had it. And Pearl said, you'll give us money for the trees, and you have to take the trees from where you're going to put the house. We don't want to lose any trees. And we sold them $2,000 worth of trees. <laughs> Pearls. <laughs> and he got to like Pearl. And when we had troubles with the, a house with the basement, she would call him. He'd come himself. He would come himself. He took care of it. And uh, we had probably one of the best lots in the whole damn place. We had all those trees in a nice flat level lot. On top of the hill? Yeah. We didn't have the water table at the client said. It was there, but it wasn't nearly as bad. They had it bad, and that's why she had the pool filled in. But when they built the pool, and I found out what it was worth, I said, well, what the, why didn't I, I build a pool? I figured it would be good for Robert because he never had any friends then. As soon as he had the pool, we had friends, yeah. And so on. And when Pearl had her problems, that's when we got the tennis court. Because she had the, what's the name of that pro? John Nogrady. No Grady, yeah. yeah. She used to arrange lessons for him on our court. And she had activity. And we could have parties there in the summertime. And uh, so it became it, the family resort, that property. Huh? It was the family party. It was the family resort with yeah. the pool and the tennis court. Yeah. It worked out well. The uh, practice, as I told you, was crummy. Yeah, I bought it cheap. And a few years later, he had two sons. And they realized I was doing fairly well then. So they came down to visit me and wanted to know how I built it up from the piece of crap that it was. Even during the war, he didn't do it too well. And he had very little competition. So I let him spend a couple of days with me. And they opened up a new haven. And then from there, I was that old. It was a walk-up building. The original 42 North Main was a walk-up right across the street from City Hall. That's the one they had the 
guy who was deaf, and when he didn't want to hear you, he wouldn't have his hearing aid on. And then when Bob Katz put up the other building at 20 North Main, I moved over. They had an elevator, and they had more room. It, it laid out well, privacy, and I did nicely there. And when Pearl got pretty bad along the way, I'm about to uh, I'm about to run out of uh, run out of space here, so I'm going to stop for a moment. Okay. Okay. I I skipped over the area where I I worked for. An, an organization called the County Optical Company. It was a small change, and I wound up in charge of it. And I, instead of working down in, in Manhattan the way I used to, he opened up a place and I went to work in Mount Vernon. And in Mount Vernon, they had built a new co-op, and I bought an apartment in that co-op. In the meantime, I had met Pearl up at the Adirondacks. Green Mansions was the name of the place, yeah. And I used to go from Mount, Ver Mount Vernon down to Brooklyn. Which, uh, it wasn't that bad. It was almost uh, three quarters an hour, an hour. And when we, when we got married, she came up, and we lived in the place I had in Mount Vernon. And that's where, that's where Robert was born. And we. Stayed in Mount Vernon for a while, but uh, I wasn't happy running the place for somebody else. And uh, I looked at one of my one of my optical magazines. I noticed there was a uh, place for sale in Norwalk, and. Uh, he wanted very little for it, which is what I had, very little. And I took a look at the place. It was at 42 North Main. And uh, I, it was run down badly. And he didn't know what the hell he was doing. And the equipment was old. It was enough to get me started. I didn't need any, any real capital except to pay him off. I gave a, a few thousand dollars, maybe it was four, I don't know. And uh, Nat Levis came up with me. He wanted to make sure that everything was taken care of legally, and it was. And I, I worked at that, and uh, I used to do my, my own shop work there. We had all the shop equipment. I used to have to use a cutter, chip it. I had a flat stone and I put on the bevel by hand and we used those metal things to for shapers. And uh, gradually I built it up. I, uh, I lowered my price some so that I attracted new people. As soon as I started to get people, I was able to raise it up. And I stayed there until uh, Bob Katz built the other building, 20 North Main, with the elevator and uh, yeah. the space I could spread out. How did you meet uh, Hannah? Hannah was a patient of mine when I was in Mount Vernon. And even when I uh, moved up here, 
she's team up here and have a rise exam. In there. But that, that was it. I think we went to dinner maybe two times. Once she invited me to her house, I met her parents. Her mother became a patient. Then uh, when when Pearl wasn't was no longer feeling well, that's when I got my first young man. But he was drafted. When he was drafted, and I had that bun, we had the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And you remember when you went to the courtroom with me, and the year ended. And I decided he wasn't the quality that I wanted. And he, had, he and Stuart tried to tell me that he was a partner. <laughs> and uh, you see what I got. Yeah, because I think Teague was the first one that was drafted. Teague, Don, Don Teague. And then uh, Grossbard or Grossman? Grossbard. Grossbard was the Grossbard. second one. Yeah. And then it became Marty Arkin was the final. Yeah. Well, it happened that shortly after I got rid of Grossbard, Marty walked in. And he looked like he had a nice personality. He looked a, a lot better than Grossbard did. And I, I told him I'd take him on these terms that he would buy into he would buy into the practice instead of me paying him so he had enough money to pay me I took him on a, on a salary differential for the 10 years he would work on a salary it would be naturally a lot less than mine and uh, he was good for it he knew he knew how to deal with people and that's and he stayed. But he came at just the right time. And then when the uh, 148 East Andrew came up, we decided to expand further, get into a nice professional building, and we were able to raise up our fees for more. And uh, in addition to which, people did want to come, come to that place when it got dark, they didn't want to be a South Lower if they had the dark. So we went in a prestige place and we were paying that off. And when the ten, 10 years are up and I was ready to retire, and I did. He had to pay me the gross of the previous day of practice, I put it into my IRA and I had some money. I had some nice money by that time. And you continued to own the condo that the practice was in. And so you owned the condo that that was in for a while more. Well, we didn't yet own it. We were, we were paying it off on a mortgage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we we arranged that, so I got I got it eventually into his hands. I didn't want to let him pay me. Oh, I said, "You're going to take a loan of X number of dollars. See what it'll cost you." at the bank, take that same amount, see what it'll cost you at the bank, and what I want to get in one piece. I don't want you to pay me by the amount. And that's what we did. It was like a reverse mortgage, I think. And I put it in my IRA, and when, when I invested it, there were good times in the market. I was a good time in the bonds, good time in the stocks. And uh, 
Yeah, I built that up quite nicely. And uh, in the meantime, I had that piece of property on Monaco Island from way back, from Bob Katz, which I, I paid off uh, every six months for every year. But there was no money. Yeah. It was, a, and uh, but I didn't, I couldn't take title to it until it was all paid off. It was paid off. That was nice. And how did you end up in Delray Beach? Well, I wound up there because Mo built a Mo bought a place near there, and I got to see all the tennis courts. At that time, I was a tennis buff. And also, Anna and Joe had rented a place where I am now. They had spent a year or two there, and I, I, I liked the setup, and I, I rented a place for the year, and uh, looked to see if there was anything I liked. And I didn't. I was ready to come back when one of the one of the brokers I played tennis with he was giving me bullshit. It was all crap. Finally he had this one I'm in now. And I saw it though so on the ground level, it had the extra bedroom, it had the extra room that I needed. That's when I got it. And it's still one of the best of the condos down there. It's a good area. It's a little out of the way, but we don't have any, any robberies there. People can't find their way out of there. It's a, and uh, so that's good. And 